Welcome to this webinar hosted by Toradex entitled Secure Over-the-Air Updates presented by Wemender. My name is Brandon Shibley. I'm a solutions architect at Toradex and I'm joined by Drew Mosley, Senior Technical Solutions Architect at Mender. Drew will be presenting the webinar today and providing us a detailed look at Mender as an OTA solution. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to jump right into the webinar today with an introduction of Mender. Embedded devices are increasingly connected to networks and or the internet, and Toradex sees a growing interest from our customers for remote over-the-air update capabilities. Mender is a remote software updating system for embedded Linux devices that is fully open source. It offers both a client and host side software for managing software update, both of which are licensed under Apache 2. They provide meta layers for Yocto and Open and Embedded, which allows their technology to integrate with embedded Linux devices using these build systems, which includes the Linux PSPs and evaluation Linux images provided by Toradex. These attributes of Mender, along with its robustness, are of particular interest to Toradex customers. Drew will give us a more detailed look into Mender, so I will pass the presentation on to him. And if you have any questions <laughs> during the webinar, I urge you to ask your questions in the question dialog of GoToWebinar, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. A recording on this webinar will be available in the next week or so at toradex.com slash webinars and at YouTube in the Toradex channel. So without further ado, I welcome Drew Mosley, a mender. Very good. Thank you so much for the introduction, Brandon. Thanks for hosting and thanks for having us. I do want to thank uh, all the attendees for joining and giving us some of their time today. I just want to start briefly, kind of discuss uh, why Mender is working with Toradex and some of the reasons we've chosen for using their platforms as reference implementations for our project. The Toradex family provides a very wide range of chips from very simple systems on up to very higher end boards that are all pin compatible, which is pretty important for our customers. It allows them to start simple at the proof of concept stage and uh, scale uh, as appropriate for their particular design while at the same time minimizing the risk. They're not changing architectures or anything midstream. The, it's all a very nice workflow for them. We've had several community users that have verified Toradex boards as reliable in their chosen platform, and they have been using the Toradex platforms for some time with Yakko and have uh, specifically requested that we support the Toradex family. So they definitely come highly recommended from some of our uh, most avid users. Additionally, Toradex is known for working very closely with the upstream communities, including U-Boot and Linux and Yakko in particular. Uh, and for an open source project like ours, that's obviously very important. We do rely heavily on open source, so it's nice to work with partners that uh, also understand and are able to work well in those communities and contribute their code back so that others can make use of them and, and make things better. Finally, the ecosystem provided by Toradex is, is extremely thorough. They do all the hardware and software development in-house. They provide significant freely available design resources, including documentations, plenty of tutorials, community mailing lists, community forums. And uh, as mentioned, uh, most of their code is available in publicly available repositories ready for folks to use. So briefly, just want to discuss some of the motivation behind why Mender was created in the first place. At the highest level, Mender is an open source project to deploy over-the-air updates for connected Linux devices. It's licensed under the Apache 2.0 license, which means you can take it into the system with minimum requirements on you, and you're able to do what you need with it in your designs. We conducted uh, fairly in-depth user tests with a large number of developers responsible for connected devices, uh, Internet of Things, and embedded Linux in particular, and a couple things stood out to us. The ability to update the devices was typically something that uh, came up in people's minds kind of late in the process. They, they might have discussed it early on, but it didn't really rise to the priority level until it was uh, fairly late in the design process. In a lot of cases, they ended up going with a, a roll-your-own solution solution simply due to time and pressure constraints and uh, just due to the fact that they came in late these uh, solutions in, in general don't have the robustness and security that we have made sure to include in our project we'll get into the details of what we mean by robustness and security in a bit but uh, a couple of the other issues that folks found with their roll your own solutions 
was that the uh, development efforts uh, typically uh, significantly higher than, than most people uh, estimate up front. Mo most of the time it takes six to 12 uh, developer months to, to fully develop a system such as, such as Mender. Um, and to, to add all the, the security robust and uh, the, the uh, intuitive user interface that we include in our system is, is it is definitely a non-trivial effort. Um, and one of the other advantages uh, of, uh, of our community process is that it is a community. It's open source. We have mailing, we have you know standard open source mailing lists with uh, all our development going on in GitHub. Our issues are publicly visible. Uh, users can can comment, they can submit defects, they can submit fixes where we are a fully open source project in that manner. So having the, the community around Mentor.io is a significant advantage. So briefly, who, who are we that develop Mender? We, our company, Northern Tech, is the commercial entity behind the, the Mender project. Uh, we are a team with extensive experience ensuring the security of Linux-based systems at scale. We're the team behind the CF Engine Configuration Management Tool, and our com customers include many large and security-sensitive organizations where downtime is not an option. You can see some of the logos on this slide, and obviously these kind of companies are are dealing with Linux at very large scales. So why are updates important? I, I, I suspect that it's not news to most of the folks on this call uh, that, uh, that, that updates are important and why, but I think it's important to, uh, to call out a, a, a few specific items. A couple of the things you can do with an OTA update system, the, the first and most obvious is patching security vulnerabilities. Uh, the new vulnerabilities are discovered all the time, and it's uh, becoming more and more important to be able to address those issues with software, with software updates. Uh, a similar uh, use of OT updates is to deploy other bug fixes that are not necessarily due to security issues, but they're but they're important to fix nonetheless. And it's uh, it's very important uh, to be able to address both security and non-security issues with an with an OTA update process. And finally, you can use OTA updates to enable new features for existing products. We'll get into a little bit of that later, but uh, the, there is certainly a, a, a potential revenue stream for being able to add new features and, and just generally keep your, your users' devices up to date. It's important to consider the cost of updates over the lifetime of the devices. Uh, without some means to do an over-the-air update, the, the only options really are to uh, have devices shipped to you or to send someone to where the devices are. And either one of those approaches can be extremely costly. Uh, it's obvious from the number of uh, consumer devices that never get updated uh, or have administrator passwords changed uh, that the, the complexity in most of the update uh, mechanisms available today is, is a bit much for these standard consumer like uh, consumer processes. There have been quite a few headlines lately. I'm sure most of you have seen some of them where critical vulnerabilities in, in various uh, consumer devices have caused uh, fairly major issues on the internet. The, these kinds of attacks are becoming sadly more frequent due to the increasing number of these devices in the wild. Uh, the, costs are, the costs to the manufacturers are likewise increasing and it's important that, that uh, the manufacturers take an active role in ensuring the security and safety of their devices after deployment. Uh, connected devices do promise a whole, many new features and, and lots of interesting new, ca new use cases. And the number of devices is growing rapidly and just as rapidly becoming an attractive target to attackers. You see things like the Mirai botnet that can be that can uh, commandeer large fleets of IoT devices and and cause significant uh, damage to the internet infrastructure. There's other malware out there such as BrickerBot, which seems to designed seems designed to counter such threats, but it's uh, not 100% clear what the motivation of things like these are. Now, when it comes to uh, non-functional aspects of an OTA update system. The first and foremost uh, feature that, that has to be included is robustness. And what we mean by robustness is that the device updates never leave the system in a bricked state. If there are network issues, if there are power issues, uh, and, a, and a device update is not completed successfully, next time the system boots, it will roll back to the known good configuration. There, there have been instances recently of uh, uh, smart lock devices, for instance, where 
uh, their their update mechanism deployed the an incorrect update, resulting in a number of brick devices requiring physical access to fix and, and repair the devices. That meant p people were locked out of their, their rentals uh, for uh, uh, upwards of uh, two and a half to three weeks. In general, Mender would have protected against this kind of issue. Um, the, the Mender system will not allow you to install an update on an incorrect device type. The device type is built into the system and it is encoded into the artifact such that you can only deploy a Mender artifact to the correct device type. Uh, I mentioned rollback, that is built into the Mender system. Um, it, we have a number of post install checks that uh, when the system boots back up, if the device is unable to connect to the management server uh, through a standard uh, TLS uh, encrypted connection, the Mender client running on the device assumes that there is an issue with the, with the update that was installed and automatically rolls back to the previous known good version. Additionally, we have a, a scripting interface that allows for application-specific uh, update uh, checks that you can, you can code up for your particular use case. Uh, this can be uh, for things like if you want to check the sanity of a database or do some kind of uh, uh, database updates and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a wide open interface that will allow you to implement whatever is appropriate for your particular application. Of course, the, the update process itself needs to be secure. This is our, our, our second uh, most important feature. Uh, TLS is always used in, uh, should always be used to ensure confidentiality in any communications between the clients and the server. Additionally, cryptographic signatures should be used for integrity and authenticity checking, verifying that the artifacts that are being installed on the device are, are the proper ones and have not been tampered with. Finally, industry best practices for server management are vital ensuring the in ensuring the security of uh, the server side pieces. So uh, not having an OTA update system is a significant disadvantage in the, in the competitive markets that we're all part of. Uh, I suspect most of you were familiar with the issue several, about two years ago where the Jeep Cherokees were able to be uh, remotely accessed and were vulnerable to a, a, um, a, an attack from from outside coming in through the cellular network. In that case, the attack was over the air, but there was no means to update the device over the air. This resulted in an extremely costly, uh, costly repair process that included either customers bringing the cars to the dealerships or receiving the USB sticks in the mail. There were uh, somewhere on the order of one and a half million cars that were recalled, which obviously gets very expensive. And even more important, it's likely that not all affected vehicles will get the fixes and so there will likely be some out there that are vulnerable to this for a very long time to come. Counter to this, having the OTA update process will give you a definite competitive advantage in the in the marketplace. The Tesla, for instance, has an over-the-air capability uh, that, that, that allows them to avoid the manual recalls that we just discussed. Additionally, there are additional revenue streams that are that are possible because of this. The self-driving uh, self-driving feature that uh, Tesla recently rolled out to existing owners allowed them to generate somewhere between three and five thousand dollars additional revenue from anyone who wanted that feature. And finally, uh, hitting a little bit ho close to home for me, uh, when when those of us here in Florida were running from Hurricane Irma a few weeks ago, uh, for users of the Tesla automobiles that had not purchased the the long range uh, battery upgrades, uh, Tesla was actually able to uh, retroactively reach into their cars and temporarily enable that feature uh, to aid in the uh, evacuation from the, from the hurricane that, uh, that hit us here a few weeks ago. So there's a lot of things you can do with having this, this OTA system available and, and, and we look forward to seeing what things are coming from it in the future. And in general, this can be, this can not have Having updates to, to these devices can be a major health issue for the general public. Uh, there are, you know, pacemakers and things like that, that that have firmware in them and that have vulnerabilities that need to be fixed. OTA updates can be used to mitigate, mitigate these kinds of issues uh, in, in medical industry as well as consumer industries such as automotive and other, uh, other industries that may have uh, similar types of uh, health or safety issues. So let's dig a, a little bit into why Mender, some of the technical details of how we do what we do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the two primary features, uh, non, the two primary non-functional features that, that drive everything we do are robustness and security. Um, as far as robustness is con concerned, 
example. Uh, automatic rollback is an absolute must. We, we support a dual AV partition layout with um, an active and a passive partition. Uh, you see on this slide uh, a diagram of the partition layout of the system. Uh, you have the bootloader and the persistent data. Those are single partitions that do not get updated by the update system, and that is by design. Obviously, updating the bootloader remotely uh, is extremely risky and, and can easily result in bricked devices. So all of the rollback code uh, that handles the automatic rollback is built into the bootloader so that that is always able to come up and pick one of the two uh, root file systems that that can be booted. Um, the 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 concept of atomic updates is extremely important for this road for this robustness. We we need to make sure that all the updates are either completely installed or not installed at all. This is one of the primary differences between this uh, full system update and some of the other package update mechanisms that you may be familiar with, uh, with uh, things such as apt-get and, and, and various desktop side uh, package updating mechanisms. Um, those updates may or may not finish. The first package may finish and the second one may fail. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to get, guarantee atomicity with those updates, whereas with our system, you are uh, updating the entire root file system. Uh, additionally, that gives you uh, a much reduced test may matrix in your development centers, you know exactly what the image that's going on the device is going to look like so that you're able to, to focus your testing on the exact, uh, exact set of bits that are going to be installed in your fleet of devices. Um, as far as robustness is concerned, we also have a number of integrity checks and we have a system for enhancing those integrity checks. As I mentioned earlier, we have some scripts that can get run at various state transitions during the, the, the life, lifetime of the Mender workflow. And one of those is on, on new device boot up, you can run various sanity checks to make sure that your application in particular is doing everything it's expected to do. And if there are issues, you can actually write code to, to find those issues and tell the Mender client that something is not right and that we should roll back. Um, and device groupings allow for controlled rollout ma management. We'll see that in a few minutes when we get into the actual demonstration. Uh, the idea being you can uh, uh, set up a phased rollout of your updates, start to get some issue reports and that kind of thing before rolling out to your device fleet as a whole. Uh, and finally, uh, minimal downtime. Our, our goal is that the users of the, these devices don't really need to know when things are going on with the vendor client. Uh, when images are being downloaded. The image itself will be streamed directly to the unused root file system partition so that the requirements for file system space in your active system are minimized. Additionally, your active system is up and running. There, there's no need for your applications to stop and, and your users to stop using your devices while a new uh, installation is being prepared. Once the installation is prepared and it's time to reboot, obviously during the reboot, uh, depending on the speed of the reboot, the, the users may notice a hiccup, but the idea is to minimize that as much as possible. Security, I already mentioned this a bit, but uh, it's definitely worth calling out again. Uh, all communications between the, the, the client and the management server are secured by standard uh, internet TLS communications. The certificates are baked into the build system and in, pre-installed on your device. So the, the security of that communication channel is, is, is as secure as it can be. Additionally, we support uh, cryptographically signing the images to ensure that, uh, to ensure the authenticity of the images that are being installed on your devices. And the nice thing about having it, uh, having that in addition to the TLS is that decouples the development side from the infrastructure side. You've got the TLS uh, in communication uh, protecting the infrastructure side, including the, the, the management server and, and all the components there. And then you've got the encryption of the devices that, that manage uh, and provide you additional security from the development side so that you can ensure that what's running on your devices is exactly what your development team is expecting to be there. A bit more about why uh, to consider Mender. Uh, Mender itself is a, a singular complete solution. And, and what I mean by that is that it's both the on-target client and the web-based management server. They're, de they're designed and developed in tandem by, by a single team. All the design decisions uh, mean that these two, these two components of the system work very well together. Uh, you are able to update both the kernel uh, and all the components of your root file system, including applications, libraries, and anything you might store in that root file system uh, in a single single mechanism and not requiring you to, to uh, cobble anything uh, extra together from, from different projects you might find uh, on, the, on the internet.
Um, Mender does support the managed updates as we've discussed with the back end, uh, and we will see that user interface here in a minute. But uh, if your needs are a little bit more modest, uh, we also support a standalone deployment model. And what this means is you're actually invoking the Mender client essentially from the command line. You, you're bypassing the, the complexity of the web user interface, but you're still getting the robustness, the dual AB root file system, the automatic rollback, and that kind of thing from the Mender client. It's just that you, you are responsible for writing the scripting to determine when up updates are available and how to locate updates. Uh, and there are a uh, number of use cases where that's a, a, we do have customers using that, and it's a, a perfectly valid uh, uh, use case for, uh, as I said, uh, less modest requirements. Um, I mentioned the scripting interface a couple times, and I kind of want to bring that back up again because it's it's not just used for post-install sanity checks. It really does allow you to adapt the Mender workflow to application-specific use cases. This basically consists of a number of scripts that get called during various uh, interesting state transitions in the Mender client itself. Uh, this can be used, for instance, uh, if you have a device that is on battery power and you want to delay uh, turning on the Wi-Fi and, 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 and doing an expensive, potentially power expensive operation like downloading an image until you get, until the device is back on uh, uh, mains power. Or if you're on Wi-Fi and the, the connection is dodgy, you might want to uh, delay doing downloads. Uh, and then, then another use case is asking for uh, user confirmation from before rebooting. Once that device has downloaded and installed a new image, uh, you know, it's a, the, the typical uh, user interface thing can pop up a, a dialog that says, you know, there's a new update, are you ready to reboot, and allow the user uh, of the device to either accept or reject the, the uh, reboot at that time. So that scripting interface does allow you to do quite a bit of customization uh, to your particular uh, system and, and application. If the flexibility provided by that is insufficient and you have much, much more custom requirements, it's possible to implement custom uh, versions of our services. Our web backend is implemented using a microservices API architecture. And what that means is uh, each of the, the various components has a, a well-defined interface and it, you can implement custom versions as long as they conform to that same a, uh, API, uh, then you're able to actually plug them in. And, and, and make use of them. One area this comes up quite frequently in discussions with uh, users is uh, our admissions service. That is the component of the backend that uh, determines which devices are allowed to connect and be part of your device fleet. By default, the, the admission service that we have implemented simply puts a uh, user interface query up and the end user is responsible for either accepting or rejecting devices. Uh, most designs that actually have a device fleet in the field will have some other mechanism for keeping track of their devices, uh, whether it's keeping track of uh, MAC addresses or some other identifiers and in, in some kind of cryptographic verification that these devices are the right ones, in which case you could implement a custom admission service that implements your specific requirements uh, to automatically allow the devices in. And as long as you, as long as you conform to our uh, HTTP RESTful API, you should be able to plug that directly into our backend and it will, it will all implement your specific, uh, specific needs. And I've mentioned the, the low system overhead. That's a, a, a major design feature as well. Uh, we, want, we want to make sure that uh, the vendor the updater does not get in your way of implementing your system. And just a couple, uh, couple more things to mention. Uh, obviously, we use compression in our artifact formats. That generally saves significant bandwidth. Typically, uh, the root file system images have a lot of text and things like that in them that compress very well. So uh, implementing uh, just basic compression in, in those artifacts is, is, of course, expected, and it is there. Uh, the user interface for the management server uh, it's it's a fairly well thought out and fairly intuitive interface, and we're constantly improving it and making it better. Uh, and we'll see that in a minute, and, and we're certainly happy to take feedback on that. And our our primary means of uh, distributing Mender right now is through the Yocto project. Uh, we we do provide meta layers with all our uh, setup and configuration that are very easy to integrate into your existing Yocto builds. Just add our layers to your configuration, set a few extra variables in your local.conf file, 
um, and you should be uh, able to run the system uh, in, in, with just uh, standard Yocto builds. And we do support, uh, as Brandon mentioned, uh, raw flash and SDMMC uh, with the, the Toradex board that we're gonna demonstrate here in a minute. That is actually a raw flash based board running UBFS. And then for other platforms, we do have SD and uh, MMC support as well. Uh, a couple of coming attractions uh, that, that uh, many folks are interested in. We are working on a hosted vendor product uh, that we hope to have out before the end of the year. That's basically a software as a service version of the, the user interface and uh, infrastructure for the back end, allowing you to focus strictly on the client side, focus on what you do best and uh, use our services for managing the back end so you don't have to deal with that. Uh, and finally, the Delta-based updates. Uh, this is uh, the, the idea of this is to take advantage of the redundancy that's inherent in any of these image updates. Typically, many of the binaries are gonna stay unchanged from one release to the next. Um, and if when we can detect that, we can actually reduce the amount of bandwidth needed for these downloads. Uh, which is I important for all sorts of reasons. One, just the, the, the general size is, is reduced to the battery, battery usage and power usage is reduced and some of the networks that some of these devices are on uh, can be fairly costly. So anything we can do to minimize the amount of updates needed to get, uh, get these updates out in the, into your system uh, make, make things better all around. And with that, I'd like to move into the product demonstration. So let's get logged in here. Okay, so now we're looking at the Mender dashboard. Uh, in this case, you see some of the activity that's gone on earlier, just some of the recent deployments. We'll get into a bit of what that means as we work through this. The four tabs at the top are really the, the kind of the heart of this interface. So we'll start with the uh, devices here. So you see right now I've got two devices. One is the Calibri IMX7 um, running the, this uh, version, the master target image 1.0. And then the other is the VXpress Kimu. That's an emulated platform uh, that, that we include in our, in our getting started uh, code uh, as something to allow you to get up and running very quickly. Uh, in our case, we'll focus on this Calibri board. When the devices first connect, um, and we didn't see it here because I've already accepted them, but the first thing that happens is the device will connect to the server, request to be admitted. Uh, the, the end user can then go admit the device. And at that point, once the device is admitted, the device will send its inventory over to the, the back end. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a set of key value pairs. Uh, the, by default, this is the, um, the these are the, the more generic things. You may have uh, particular inventory fields that are useful for your application. Uh, this is fairly easy to expand upon. Uh, it's just a set of scripts that return key value pairs. So you should be able to uh, plug in any additional inventory uh, that goes into this. The device ID, similarly, you know, it's based on uh, on this information. Uh, it's a it's intended to be a unique ID identifier for for each of your devices. So you can actually add information to that based on your particular particular application if you have something uh, something more unique, for instance, in the MAC address. Uh, by default, that's what we use, but there, there are other, there may be other fields you wish to include. Um, the artifacts, I mentioned this term before, um, part of the output of, uh, of a Yocto build, there's, there's two main outputs. One is what is the SD image file, and that's uh, the raw binary bits that get uh, written to the flash memory. Uh, that includes um, as, as we mentioned, uh, all four of the partitions uh, that, that are needed to bring a system up. That's the actual raw code that will bring the system up. Uh, ad in addition to that SD image file, we produce uh, a, an artifact file, which has the extension .mender, and that's effectively one single root file system, some metadata, some scripting, and that kind of thing. So when you're, when you're deploying an update, you're actually only deploying the one root file system as opposed to two. So in this case, I've got a couple different artifacts. You can see the information about them. Uh, it's pretty straightforward information about what you would expect. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, keeping track of the device type compatibility is extremely important. So this board will only install on boards that are identified as Calibri IMX7 Mender. There's no way for me to attempt to install this on another board, even if it happens to be running the same architecture. If it's not specifically called a Calibri IMX7 Mender, the client will refuse to install it. And then deployments, that's, that's essentially taking an artifact and pushing it onto a device. 
Um, so I, I did want to mention the device groupings. That's one thing that a lot of a lot of people ask about. Uh, this is a fairly flexible uh, mechanism here. You see, right now I've just got a, a device group called early adopters uh, to kind of simulate a phased rollout. Um, and the idea being here, I've only put my Calibri board in here so that I can I can deploy artifacts directly to this board. If I had a large fleet of devices, I might only have you know one or two of them here to give me give me a test platform. Once I get uh, some semblance of uh, sanity out of my build, then I might. Uh, I, I could uh, roll it out to a larger larger group of uh, devices. So let's take a look real quick. I'm going to switch over to my uh, console window here. So you see here, uh, this is actually logged in. It's the serial port from the board. Uh, you see that I'm running master target image 1.0. That's uh, in this file here, slash Etsy, Etsy Mender Artifact Info. Uh, and that matches what we saw in the user interface uh, for the back end. Now I'm going to switch back over to that and I'm going to trigger a deployment um, of what I'm calling one, image 1.1. 1 .1. Now in this case, I happen to know that this image is bad and is going to, uh, it's not, this deployment is not going to succeed. And this way you'll actually get to see the full automated rollback. So it takes a, a second or two uh, before the next device check-in uh, before the deployment itself moves from pending to in progress. And now we can kind of view the progress of the, the deployment here. You see right now it's in the downloading state, which typically is the, the longest, uh, longest phase of, uh, of any of the steps of the deployment. Uh, when I was doing this before, it was running about 45 seconds or so. So we'll give this another second. While that's running, I'll go ahead and switch us back over to the serial console so that once the, the download completes, uh, we can actually see that the device automatically re reboots. And so now we've got our reboot going on. Now it's trying to boot up into my 1.1 image. I've got a, a trigger in here which forces the system to reboot, simulating a, a, a bad update. Um, and then the next time it comes back through, U-boot will see that the device has not, or sorry, that the update was not committed and detect and determines that that should now be rolled back. Um, so we're, we're into the second reboot here. And in a moment, we'll be able to log in and check that artifact info file. So now you see that we're back to Mender master target image 1.0. Um, and if we come back over to our backend user interface, you'll see that this deployment has been uh, triggered as a failure. If we go back into our device window, you'll see that this is uh, still at, uh, at the 1.0 image. All right, so now I'm gonna trigger a deployment with the next release. This one I know is good. This is 1.2. Uh, trigger it to the same device groups. In fact, I'm going to, in this case, trigger it to all devices. Now you can see here, this, this particular artifact is only, I only have a version of this artifact for the Calibri IMX7 Mender board. So in this case, I'm selecting all devices, but only one of the two devices will be updated. And that's because one of the devices is, a, is the Calibri IMX7 Mender and one is not. So we'll go ahead and trigger that deployment and we'll let that run. And we will go move back over to the serial ter terminal. And again, you should we, we should see this in just a moment. The system will reboot, and then it should stop at the 1.2 uh, artifact. Okay, so the, the download and install has completed. We are doing a full reboot. And now you see that we are at target image 1.2. If we come back over to the, the management console, as soon as the device checks back in, this uh, deployment will be marked as successful. And while we're waiting for that, I'll go ahead and pull this up. Uh, this, this final slide has some links that are that may be of interest to you, specifically this top link here, the getting started. Uh, at that link, 
there are instructions and uh, links to uh, code that you can download uh, and set up a full Docker Compose environment uh, to actually run the Mender, uh, Mender backend on your system um, and, and, and you run this exact setup that I have here, obviously without the hardware, but it does include a, an emulated device uh, and artifacts to allow you to start playing with the Mender, Mender system and get familiar with how it works. Uh, and we, we certainly would love for you to give that a try. Uh, there's there's uh, additional contact information for both myself and Brandon here. Uh, if you have any questions that we didn't answer here and you want to reach out, obviously feel free to do so. Uh, and I think, uh, Brandon, with that, we'll open it up for questions. All right, excellent. Uh, well, thank you, Drew, for that uh, presentation. Do you have some questions here? And if anybody else has questions, please uh, enter those into the dialog of uh, question dialog of GoToWebinar. Um, we have a few minutes here, which will take questions. And also, this webinar, as I mentioned earlier, will be provided as a recording at toradex.com slash webinars. Uh, it will probably take a week or so to, to come up. And uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions afterwards. So let's get to the uh, questions that we have here. So the first question, will this work for cloud-based system update with which is useful for IoT applications. I'm not quite sure what, what, what that would look like, but there's nothing we're doing in the Mender client that is non-standard Linux uh, bits. As long as you've got, I mean, the big, the, I, I guess the big restriction right now with uh, that kind of setup is that uh, we kind of assume you have U-boot on your device. So if your cloud-based device is running a U-boot based system, uh, yeah, it should work just fine. Uh, there have been uh, discussions on how to, to, to broaden that, that uh, support, but it's not something that's available yet, uh, yet today. Okay, great. Does Mender support build root? And if not, will it in the future? We don't support it today. Again, uh, there's nothing unique in, in, in what we're doing that's specific to Yocto. Uh, it's just from, from our perspective, that was, the, uh, that was the, the, the system of choice. I know there have been folks on our mailing list who have discussed supporting things like build root uh, and, and other systems. Uh, and there certainly uh, certainly uh, has been desire from folks. Uh, if that's something you're interested in, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us directly. Uh, we are planning to extend the platform support going forward, uh, but uh, you know, I don't have specific details that I can share with you right now. Um, but uh, if you want to join our mailing list uh, and, and and interact with us there, uh, you can do that. Uh, and you know we are happy to take contributions for that if it, you know if it's something you want to implement yourself or if you you know are interested in, in working with us to do it uh, feel free to reach out to, to me directly or better yet to the contact at mender.io address as shown on this slide okay excellent and I see a couple other questions that have also come in um, regarding support for other non yocto uh, solutions such as Debian or Windows embedded compact um, so I I think your answer here applies there as well, but I'll give you one more chance to address that. Yeah, well, cer certainly uh, f not for Windows Embedded. Uh, if they, if if I heard you right on that one, um, because every you know our our, uh, our client obviously won't run on that. It's it, there's no reason it couldn't be made to happen, but uh, I, I imagine yeah, the, uh, the the the, li <laughs> the amount of effort for that is significantly more than uh, you know more for things like Debian. And I know I have seen uh, community community members having some success. Uh, with with, with uh, using Mender to update uh, various, I, I don't remember off the top of my head whether it was Ubuntu, Debian, or Raspbian, but, uh, and it's obviously, it's, you know, at, that, at, at this point, it's a uh, proof of concept level. Uh, they've gotten it working, so, so, so that's great, but uh, uh, if it's something you're looking to roll out in a, um, uh, in a commercially available product, uh, obviously feel free to reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to work together. Okay, great. And, uh, Next question is, is it possible for the end user to initiate the update from the client side? Yes, and that's, uh, I mentioned that briefly, that's, we do have, uh, the, the client can run in standalone mode. Um, so generally speaking, the Mender client runs as a daemon checking in with the, the backend mode. That's in the fully managed mode. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the, the uh, backend is the one responsible for 
triggering updates and that kind of thing. Uh, if, if you do want to just, if you have an update, say on a USB stick uh, and you want to write some scripting that says, you know, my device isn't uh, necessarily connected at all, all the time, but I, I've got a, a means of updating with a USB stick. Uh, you could write a simple script that runs, checks for the presence of that USB stick and uh, uh, invokes the Mender client uh, directly with a file-based URI instead of an HTTP-based URI. Um, you know, in that case, obviously you're not taking advantage of the flexibility the web UI provides, but uh, you are getting the robustness, the the automatic rollback, and and, and all the other benefits of uh, the Mender, uh, the the client side of the Mender Mender update system. Okay, excellent. And um, can reboot be delayed? Can it wait for a user to perform the reboot or prompt them? Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that can be handled by our state scripting support. Um, it's you know obviously it's not something we can implement in general, uh, but uh, there are callbacks we make once the update has been installed and is ready to go. There's a state transition that happens, and you can in input any number of scripts there, uh, and they don't even have to be scripts. They can be any executable that returns an error, returns a return code uh, to the Mender client. And I, I don't remember the specifics off the top of my head, but you know, a return code of one, I think, means do not make the state, state transition, and a return code of zero means do make the state transition. So you can implement a script that uh, you know simply pops up a, a UI dialog uh, for the end user, uh, and as long as that script doesn't return, uh, we, the Mender client will sit there waiting, uh, and if the user says, no, don't reboot now, then you just return the error code. Uh, the Mender client will respect that and uh, will not do the reboot. Okay, and is there a document that describes the particular U-boot build configuration items or patches that are required for Mender's atomic update support? Are out-of-tree patches required, or can this be supported via mainline U-boot? Um, most of the details are available in our documentation. Uh, if you go to docs.mender.io, uh, this is the getting started link here that I mentioned earlier. If you dig down more into um, into the architecture, there's there's more details about exactly what is needed. Our um, our needs on U-Boot are fairly modest. Uh, we don't require significant out of U-Boot patches in terms of code. Uh, some of the configuration can be a little bit tricky. Uh, the, we use the config boot count feature, which is a standard part of U-Boot for handling the automatic rollback. So we're not adding functionality in that perspective. Uh, most of the complexity that we add currently comes from the actual boot scripts themselves. Um, so we do we do require, uh, sorry, not boot scripts, but uh, the, the U-Boot environment. Uh, we, we do put additional steps into the uh, the boot command environment variables uh, that uh, invoke the Mender, the, the Mender logic to to handle the detection of rollback and that kind of thing. Uh, so there there is some some patching that needs to be done uh, for any given device. Uh, we have uh, out of the box support for a few devices, uh, but uh, right now uh, most of that, uh, you know, you'll be for, for your particular custom device. Obviously, you'll be needing to implement that yourself. But it's it's reasonably straightforward. Uh, the, there are details in our docs, and obviously our sources uh, and, and our meta Menda layers are available for uh, even deeper inspection. Uh, and if you have uh, uh, um, more uh, needs than that, again, feel free to reach out to us or join us on the mailing list and uh, we'll see what we can do to get you uh, supported. All right, and if a connection is spotty or unstable, do updates need to fully complete in one continuous session or can they be performed across multiple uh, connection drops? Um, right now, uh, if the connection drops, uh, the, the library we're using, I believe, will. Uh, on reconnect will reattempt to download. We do not support partial downloads, but it is something that uh, is on our radar screen anyway. I don't know that we have a definitive uh, definitive target for it, but it is something that has been discussed. Okay, and can you um, describe the commercial services that uh, Mender offers? Sure. I mean, uh, we're happy to to provide. Uh, uh, you know, most of the services we provide obviously are, are around integrating Mender into your device. Uh, if you have needs for some some customization on the back end, we're happy to help with that. If you uh, if you have a, a device that doesn't currently have uh, Mender support on the target, we're happy to support. We're, we're we're happy to help you with that. 
uh, again, that contact at mender.io email address is the best place to get uh, information there. Uh, and you know, if you have other, uh, other needs related to Yocto and embedded Linux, uh, we're happy to help with that. Um, and you know, of course, the hosted Mender is coming soon, so that should help uh, simplify things. And uh, you know, if you uh, if you if you have uh, uh, any anything I didn't mention, but uh, you think we might be uh, able to help you out, uh, drop us an email, and we'll uh, see what we can do to help. Okay. And um, you showed automatic rollback uh, functionality, but can you also write tests to determine if updated applications uh, are behaving properly? Sure, and that that again that comes back to that scripting interface that we have. Uh, there's a post install set of post install scripts. Uh, you know, you just uh, there's a, a particular naming scheme we use. You drop them in the in the right directory, uh, and once the system is booted, all of those post install scripts will be called. Uh, and, and and similar to uh, the scripting for uh, user. Uh, uh, acceptance of reboots. Uh, if the if the script is happy, it returns one error code. If the script determines there's uh, something that is uh, not good in the update uh, and it should be rolled back, it returns uh, returns an error uh, and the Mender client will respect that and it will uh, reboot without committing the update and uh, force the rollback to the, the known good configuration. All right, and what's the best way to begin evaluating Mender on Toradex modules? Uh, right now, it's uh, getting this getting started link here that will get you up and running uh, with the Kimu environment. As far as uh, testing it on the the, the Toradex models, that's something we're 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 still working on how to get those images available to folks. Uh, reach out to myself or Brandon. I I think if you hear anything from anybody, obviously you and I will be in touch, uh, and and we'll figure out how to how to get that out to folks. All right, and is Mender able to deal with? mostly read-only root file systems? Yeah, I, I, I see no reason why it wouldn't. Uh, all the, 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 the data that Mender uses uh, is stored in that persistent data partition. So uh, the expectation is that um, the, 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 the idea of read-only root file systems, uh, we should easily be able to support that. Uh, and that, that, that plays into uh, the discussion we had regarding uh, regarding the, the the Delta updates, because if you've got a, a read-only root file system, uh, that greatly simplifies uh, the, the the detection of the differences. Right? If we know that the root file system is read-only, we we know that what you have installed is exactly what was installed uh, previously. So we can do a lot more on the server side to to, to uh, do those Delta updates. It's it's unclear if that's how you know we're we're still working on the design of that, but that is certainly uh, certainly something that has been discussed. All right, great. That gets us to the end of the questions. So thank you again, Drew. I think it should be interesting for a lot of our customers to, to work with Mender. And uh, so we look forward to that. Let us know if you have any interests and or any questions related to the webinar. Again, reaching out to Drew or I is a great way to get started. And um, I'll let uh, Drew have the last word here. All right, well, thank you so much. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, to, to spend some time with us today. I know uh, uh, time is always uh, in short supply for all of us and it's extremely valuable. So I, I, I hope you uh, got what you needed. And uh, like I say, uh, my email address uh, is, is available uh, in the slides. Uh, you know, feel free if you've got any questions or need any follow-up, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great day. You can catch the uh, recording of this webinar at toradex.com slash webinars. It should be available in the next week or so. Take care. Bye-bye.